Hello, biology, and welcome to a video lecture. For some of you, this is going to be stuff you do today because I am not here, and for others of you, it will be homework. Um, really, what we're going to be doing today is talking about, A, what defines an ecosystem, um, what abiotic factors, non-living factors, determine the rainfall and temperature of a location, hint. Those are the two things that really define an ecosystem. And then you're going to be applying those concepts to how they're important for biological diversity in life. That M after the question mark shouldn't be there, so let's delete it. Um, a reminder, when we do these sorts of things, that you can access the video link here, and then if you lose your notes, the note sheet is there. So let's get started. Um, so when we talk about biomes, um, remember we introduced that word last week or two weeks ago with pikas. Um, a biome is going to be a particular type of ecosystem or broad categories of living organisms and abiotic factors that are really particular to that category. So the two main factors that determine what type of ecosystem your biome has is the annual and seasonal precipitation. And this is really important because rainfall is one of the two inputs or factors or ingredients for photosynthesis. So the amount of rainfall that you have, whether in a day, a month, a year, is going to be really important for how much your plants can grow. And plants are the food source for organisms or other organisms that eat them. And then secondly is average or seasonal temperature. And this is really important because water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And if their temperatures are significantly cooler than that, you're not going to have any plant growth, but also if we're thinking about soil formation or dead stuff being broken down, you need to have an adequate temperature for nutrient cycling. So based on those two different factors, we can create a climograph that sort of looks like this, where different ecosystems are going to be defined based on these high and low precipitation and high and low temperature ranges. So if you want to find a tropical rainforest, all you need to do is find a place that has at least 250 centimeters of rainfall per year and at least has 22 degrees on average for its temperature in Celsius. But if you decrease rainfall or decrease temperature, you're quickly going to shift away from that. So we can see in the United States that, you know, we have about eight different types of biomes. Temperate and tropical really refer to the type of temperature profile. And then we have things like grasslands and forests and shrubs and broadleaf forests. And it's a whole mosaic. And for homework, you're going to be exploring two different locations that have a different ecosystem profile than the temperate um, broadleaf forest seen in Vermont and most of New England. So for still Vermont, this is our temperature profile. And what we're seeing right here is the average high, the average median, and average low temperature for each month. So we take up the 31 days high temperature in January, the average and the low, and this is how we get this temperature profile. So with temperature, it's really important to know these high and lows because that might tell you when and how frost is occurring. That's really important for plant growth, especially in April and October. That's really when we're going to start seeing plant growth start and also be stopped. It's important for telling species when they should hibernate or undergo torpor, which is another type of hibernation. Um, it's really important for when cold-blooded organisms need to get in the mud, which frogs do. They freeze themselves. Um, or snakes slither away and form large dens to keep warm. So I want you to analyze this graph thinking about which months show really good evenness between high and lows. For example, August has seven degrees below and seven degrees above its median average, and which months show unevenness. And then the other thing that we can look at is rainfall. And with rainfall, it's important to sh uh, consider monthly rainfall for photosynthesis, um, animal well-being, um, and also crop production when we grow our foods. And this is recorded in inches. It's important to note that we can convert snowfall into inches of rain. And my question for you is, why might snow 
we see the less precipitation in the winter, noting that rainfall again has been, or snow has been converted into rainfall. Why do you think there's less precipitation in cold months as opposed to warm months? So now that we've talked about snow and we've talked about our temperature and uh, precipitation profile, let's take a look at the three main factors that make an ecosystem have its different characteristics. Oh, and this is what we call a climograph. You'll be making these for your homework. So the first factor is latitude and elevation. Now latitude is the measurement of distance away from the equator. One full degree is approximately 69 miles. So Stow is 45 degrees north latitude. So you would take 45 and multiply it by 69 and that's how many miles away we are from the equator. And this is important because, because of the tilt of the earth and the relative position at any given time of the year, Sunlight strikes most directly at the equator or near the equator, meaning it's really concentrated. You get more energy. Think about those things we went out with last week that could measure sunlight per area. And the further away you go from the equator, the more sparse, the more dissipated, the more um, unconcentrated that sunlight is. So it means that you have less sunlight for plants to grow and for food for animals to eat. Um, and this gets more exasperated because the differences between summer and winter months become greater and greater as you go up further and further from the North Pole. So if we look at this figure at the equator, you effectively have around 12 hours of sunlight each day at the equator. And that sunlight is really concentrated. So high power sunlight consistently throughout the year. If you go to 70 degrees north for a brief amount of time, you get close to 24 hours of daylight, but that sunlight is still not that concentrated. And at other times of the year, you have effectively zero hours of daylight, meaning you can't grow plants. It's probably going to be really cold. So latitudes further away from the equator have less sunlight for the year. Um, and that means that they tend to have cooler average temperatures they have lower minimums. The further away you are from the equator, the less heat you will have on average and the colder your temperatures will be. That's a general outcome of latitude on temperature. And when it comes to rainfall, the further away you are, the less heat you have, the less sunlight you have, which makes rainfall um, evaporate less. So we would expect less rainfall annually or for certain months, depending on your um, location and its season. You probably would expect some rainfall to be happening in Alaska in the summer months. During the winter months, it's a really cold and really dark. Rainfall and precipitation is probably much lower. So two questions to answer for um, latitude. What would happen to Stowe's rainfall in the summer and winter months if we moved further north? Explain. You could even predict using the graph from the last slide changes. And then how would our daily max and min temperatures in December and July change if we move to 30 degrees north or roughly in South Carolina? So with this question, you want to go back and think about what changes would happen here if we move north and what changes would happen here and here if we moved south. Okay. The next factor is bodies of water. Um, if you ever have heard the saying, a uh, watched kettle never boils, um, water takes a lot of heat to boil the liquid into a steam, meaning it has a really high heat capacity. It can absorb a lot of heat without changing temperature. Alternatively, if you go home and cook, your pans that you fry an egg in have a really low heat capacity, so they heat up quite quickly, which is why you burn your hands if you touch a really hot pot. Um, this means that if the air temperature is really cold, water bodies are actually going to release heat. They are known as a heat sink. So in the winter time or when the air is cool outside, water actually releases heat or steam to the air. Alternatively, if it's really hot out, um, air temperatures are going to have that excess heat go into the cooler water bodies. So in the cool or in the hot weather, um, water sort of acts as a heat sink. And we can see this pretty accurately at 
summertime, when you look at the temperatures of the coast of New England, notice they're all in the 50s and 60s, versus inland, which tend to be 70s and 80s. So this is where the excess heat coming from the air is being absorbed by these bodies of water. What this means is locations closer to bodies of water tend to have average temperatures that are a little bit more moderate and smaller temperature ranges between the highs and the lows on a daily basis. Um, and this is because during the nighttime, the water will release heat and during the daytime, it will absorb heat. Um, and this is true for locations at the same latitude. So notice if I go from Wiscasset, Maine to Lebanon, New Hampshire, same amount of sunlight, but a 20 degree temperature change. And what this means for rainfall is locations closer to bodies of water will have higher amounts of rainfall, especially during the warmer, sunnier months. Um, and that's because all of this heat going into the water will cause more water to evaporate, forming more clouds. We would expect to have more precipitation on the coasts as a result of this. So my first question for you to analyze this second factor is would niche generalists or specialists prefer environments near bodies of water? Why or why not? And secondly, how might Stowe's temperature and rainfall graph change if we um, took ourselves and moved ourselves right next to Lake Champlain? What would you expect to see for our temperature and rainfall graphs if we moved besides Lake Champlain, say where Burlington is? And again, with this one, you want to be really specific with changes that you're making to this graph and this graph in terms of numbers. And then our last factor is elevation in mountains. So especially if you have mountains near a body of water, um, we tend to see a effect called a rain shadow. And this is because air is less dense as you gain elevation and this causes it to hold less heat and energy. You might know this if you've ever gone to altitude, say Colorado, you might feel a little lightheaded because per breath of air, you're getting less oxygen because those gas molecules are further spread apart. Now, because air is holding less heat and less energy, it means it tends to be a little bit cooler and a little bit drier and precipitation has happened before it's reached that elevation. So when water vapor cools, especially if it rapidly accelerates over a mountain, it causes condensation. Cool condenses. And then we have precipitation occurring. And this forms what we call rain shadows on mountains. It also releases a lot of heat stored in that liquid water. So these sides of the mountains tend to be wetter and warmer as a result of air rising, cooling, and condensing. And we can see this throughout the world. This is the Himalayas. So this is India, and this is Mongolia, and Nepal, and parts of China. Notice lots of snow from precipitation, really lush vegetation on this side of the mountains. We call this the wind side. And then notice dry, barren deserts on the lee side of the other mountains. So all of the rain coming from moist air from the Indian Ocean comes north hits the Himalayas, cools and condenses, causing lots of precipitation, and then falls and dry, causes dry cold air on this side. So the two outcomes of this is the closer you are to sea level, the warmer your temperatures will be. That's always true. The closer you are to sea level, the warmer your temperatures will be. If you have locations at higher elevations, they will always have less precipitation. But on the first side, the wind side of the mountains, they'll always have more. The other side will be drier, less humid, and cooler on the other side. So my question for you is, thinking about our precipitation and temperature, what would happen if we moved Mount Mansfield to the other side? What would happen if we took Stowe and put ourselves where Underhill and Jericho, Vermont is? Um, and this is because our weather travels from the west going to the east. So we are on the east side of Mount Mansfield. What would happen if we went to the west side? So that should be the three main factors that you learn about today. And for homework slash in class, if you have extra time for Friday slash for those of you who are looking at this on Tuesday, you're going to be making some climbing graphs. 
Now, climb a graph is used to summarize with two types of data. We have a bar graph that shows us the average rainfall. You can either do it in millimeters or inches. And this is showing Janu January, February, March, et cetera, et cetera. And then a line graph on the other axis is showing the average daily temperature. And this will help us understand what months are good for growing or not good for growing and for animal and plant life. So your directions are going to be choosing two locations in the United States that have different ecosystems than Vermont, so you can't use temperate broadleaf forests. And you're going to be thinking about what sort of factors are going on in these locations to make this ecosystem have a different biome and a different set of characteristics than Vermont. To do this, if we go into doo -doo -doo, our climograph document, the first thing you're going to want to do is find a location where you can plot this data. So let's say I want to go to St. Louis, um, Missouri. You're going to want to go to the Wikipedia page, and you're going to want to find Let's see if they have it. Geographies. Sometimes the place you can find it. There we go. You might find something that looks like this, which is going to show you the average um, temperatures and rainfall. You could easily use this data. But I want to find a different. Maybe St. Louis is not the best place. Let's go to. Phoenix. Arizona. This is embarrassing. The two places I'm picking don't have a... Oh, there's climate. Bingo. Okay, so what we're really looking for, bingo, is this. A lot of Wikipedia pages have this data table that show you the mean, the daily mean maximum, the daily mean, and the daily mean minimum, you would use this data to help create your line graph. And they also show you the average precipitation in inches for each month. We would want to use for each of these graphs the taller value because they're in inches and they're in Fahrenheit. Yes, I know it's a science class, science class but we can use those two uh, data points. So you would use that to create your climate graph, creating a key on one side for rainfall and one side for temperature. And then you're gonna be filling in this information. What's your location? What's your biome? Latitude, elevation, and relative distance to the ocean. Is it near or far? That should allow you to then explain what sort of factors between latitude, elevation, and distance makes your biome have the characteristics that it does. Lower high rainfall, lower high temperature. And then I want you to answer these four questions by applying old information from the first two weeks of class to the new information. We will be going over um, A, the questions in the white boxes on in class, but also talking about your climate graphs. There will be a flex, I know, on Wednesday and Friday. So feel free to come see me and ask for help on this. Enjoy the rest of your day.